My first memory of disordered eating is really hard to pinpoint because to me it didn't feel like it was disordered. It was something that I'd lived with for so long. Um, this is actually my first journal from when I was 15 years old. This was 2009 and I decided to turn down every page that has something about my eating disorder and it was basically every single page. 31st of March 2009. I successfully didn't eat anything except for a bit of thick shake at work for 17 hours straight. I'm on another diet. I know it's the stupid way, but it's the easiest. So Saturday I went 20 hours without a single spot of food. Sunday was 19 to 21 hours. I feel horrible doing this to my body, but I can see it working already. Once I've lost the weight to get the measurements I need for Miss Teen Australia, I will start being healthy. Plot twist, I never did. With eating disorders, they're more likely to be experienced by women and girls, but what we don't recognize and certainly, you know, people find it difficult to identify in themselves and in other people is that males constitute like a pretty large minority. They really are experienced across the range of ages, um, ethnicity, weight status. Just in an adolescent study that we conducted with over 5,000 adolescents, we saw who met criteria for all the different eating disorders and there are nine different eating disorders. And apart from anorexia nervosa, which by definition can only occur in someone who's underweight, all the other eating disorders were much more likely to occur in adolescents who fit the obese uh, BMI category. The fact that I was never skinny, I think, was a really important factor there in taking eating disorders seriously. I think a lot of people don't realise that eating disorders come in a multitude of shapes and forms and sizes. And if you don't fit that specific formula for anorexia, for bulimia, um, for binge eating disorder, if you don't specifically fit, you don't feel validated enough. You don't feel like your disease is legit enough. Your mental health crisis is, you know, real. Maybe if I was a better dancer, maybe if I had more confidence, maybe if I was skinnier, maybe if I was prettier, everything will get better when I'm thin. Skinny will bring me happiness and peace of mind. There's definitely a stigma about eating disorders. They are trivialised. Um, they're seen as issues of vanity um, or of poor self-control. And that's hugely problematic for people who want to seek help. The other issue with eating disorders is if you have an eating disorder, but you are, are not the stereotypical young, thin, white female, then it's doubly hard for you to have an, your eating disorder detected by a health professional, such as your GP, um, or to have it taken seriously by other people who might support you in your journey for recovery. I think all of my friends noticed and just kind of didn't take it seriously. This is what I hate the most is that people don't take people seriously. They don't take symptoms and warning signs seriously. You could fix so many issues early on. Like if someone had stepped in and tried to help me back then, I think it would have saved me so much trouble and hassle in the future. It's sort of inconvenient that I can't bring myself to purge. I have tried but I get scared and stop. I'm scared that if I do it, I won't be able to stop. The second time it got bad was when I was in college and this was probably the most disruptive time because this was when I finally gave in to bulimia and started to purge. Um, it started with laxatives. Um, it ended with vomiting my every meal I ate, every day. I already feel the need to rid my body of every bit of food because I can. I fear what I'm willing to do to my body, but at the same time, I welcome it. Starving yourself is one thing, but purging was just this whole next level of shame and guilt and release. Sometimes I despise myself so much. 
I've ordered Uber Eats three times today and spewed my guts up each time, respectively. I hate it. I can't control it. It was at that time that people realised that I needed help. I didn't want it, but they were determined to give it to me. My college got involved, my parents were involved, my friends were involved, and I ended up for a while getting better to spite everyone because I wanted everyone off my back and I just had to sort of calm down. And I did for a while. I dropped out of uni and then I started my YouTube channel. We know that eating disorders are definitely multi-determined, which means that there's multiple risk factors that um, cause the development of eating disorders. When you think about you know, if, if at, at least at a subclinical level, these behaviours are increasing, then you do start to think, well, what has changed in the past, you know, 10, 20 years? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Our move to social media and having smartphones, it's very different to the media landscape that was around previously. Those first five years of doing social media, which is so much fun, like it was just up, up and up. We just started doing this thing and it just lifted off. Like it was that classic, you know, 2012, 2013, Jenna Marbles time. It was great. As time went on, social media kind of just got way more intense as I think we're all aware. And it just kind of switched something in my brain that made me go full like competitor. <laughs> and so I went from being like super happy, like I honestly think that YouTube saved me from my eating disorder. It gave me something to put my energy into and it made me so much happy again and refined myself. And then it stripped it all away again and made me question everything about myself. 29th of August, 2018. Dear social media, you ruined me. Which is funny because originally you saved me. You lured me in with your false pretenses, with your unrealistic view of what life is, what life should be. You lured me in with promises of success, fulfillment, happiness. And then you ruined me, like you ruin everyone like you ruin everything. Heavy days. In 2018, when I came out online about my eating disorder, I was overwhelmed by the amount of friends and followers that reached out to me to say that they could personally relate to my story. This hit me at a time when I feel so, so similar to you. Thank you so much for sharing. I'm going through something similar. I've been in recovery from an eating disorder for over two years. Word for word, this is what I've been going through. I know exactly how you feel. I just want to thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being a voice for this serious subject. I wish I had the courage to speak about my problems like this. Whether it be a full-blown eating disorder, body dysmorphic thoughts, or drastic dieting, how common this experience was completely contrasted with how alone I'd felt throughout it all. With this in mind, I reached out to my audience on Instagram. In the theme of my doco, I am coming to you filter free. I wanted to see if you guys would be willing to help me out. So if you guys are open to answering some polls, there's going to be some polls popping up um, coming soon on my stories. And I would really appreciate if you answered them truthfully. Over 1,000 regular consumers of beauty, lifestyle and influencer content responded. And the results shocked me. 72% of people surveyed didn't feel confident in their bodies. 60% have had issues with binge eating. 50% believe that they have suffered from body dysmorphia. And while only 10% have been clinically diagnosed with an eating disorder, 51% believe that they have suffered from one. Least surprisingly, 89% believe that social media has played a role in their poor body image. And 90% believe that influencer culture is partly to blame for the rise in low body image. With eating disorders, we've always thought of media as being influential in terms of, you know, the culture, the appearance culture, influencing people's body ideals and then people striving to attain um, an unrealistic ideal for their own bodies. Um, but back then, you know, back 20, 30 years ago, we were really talking about magazines and people 
having magazines with models who were, you know, unrealistically thin and, and people trying to do the same with their own bodies. But nowadays we have smartphones which we can look at much more frequently. We're looking at not only models, but actually also our peers, our friends who put up photos or selfies of themselves, which are uh, actually unrealistic and idolized and, and often manipulated. I just, I tried so hard to be this perfect version of myself. And you try so hard and you end up staring at yourself on Instagram and I was face tuning. Oh my God, I was face tuning like no tomorrow. I would skinny myself in every single photo. <laughs> like I don't actually know what I looked like at all because I would delete photos that I thought I looked fat in and I would skinny all the others. All I can tell you is for probably three years, every single photo of me looks probably about like two inches skinnier than what I was. <laughs> I think that influencer culture, investigating the impact of influencer culture uh, on people's body image would be an excellent PhD project. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and a really important one. People should be looking at this. I'm serious. Um, is that I don't think there has been much research, if any, at all, on this question. Um, and yet, it's an important one. On the more negative side, if you've got influencers who are promoting this idea that you know that your natural self, the way it looks right now, without being fixed, is unacceptable and needs to change. Um, I think that that is problematic. On the other hand, you could have influencers who are really promoting a very healthy body acceptance message. Um, and that could be really great and really helpful and, uh, and could target just so many more people than individual prevention programs. There is real potential there to, to make a, a big difference um, by harnessing the power of, of influencers. Shooting more. Okay, I think I'm filming now. I wanted another opinion. Okay, do you want to tell me a little bit about yourself and what you do for a living? <laughs> what we did back in the day. <laughs> do, you want to, do you want to ask that again? <laughs> so we don't look like we're laughing. <laughs> so I reached out to a close friend of mine, beauty and lifestyle influencer, Michelle Crossan. My name is Michelle and I am an Irish girl who used to be an influencer in Australia. And now I'm back in Ireland and I was creating lifestyle content and makeup content. Michelle is a loud advocate for mental health on her social media platforms and has always been open with her audience about her own struggles with depression and anxiety. It's no secret to you guys that I have struggled with depression and anxiety in the past. I'm not ashamed of that. I'm really proud that I shared that with you guys. She regularly shares content designed to make people feel less alone and had a lot to say on the role of social media in today's society. I think I have been extremely affected by social media and even old school media since there was just magazines, since it was MTV, since it was YouTube, Instagram, like the progression of everything up till now, even TikTok is the new thing. When I first started, it was really like I used to have a really bad body image and I used to think when I was smaller than I am now, that I was overweight. I couldn't show my arms on camera. I couldn't do this, I couldn't do that, I couldn't wear this. It really restricted the content that I created because I didn't think I looked the right way to do that type of video. Whereas now, I feel like Stephanie and I have been through social media's arc of change where it went from the airbrush perfection to now that's actually looked down on. What's really celebrated is people being very real and normal and not trying to be like the magazines. I no longer follow the people who are just famous and pretty or, you know, on the Kardashian level. Now I'm choosing to expose myself to people who are like, here are my stretch marks. Here's what a postpartum, you know, body looks like. I now know that I need to decide what I expose myself to. I still every now and then will have days where I'm like, oh my God, she's amazing, she's beautiful. None of us feel good enough. Even the ones who you think are the elite, most beautiful, Victoria's Secret level girls. They are looking at somebody else going, oh, they're younger, they're thinner, they're curvier. They're... Everybody feels not enough of something. Influencer culture isn't worse than any other culture. I think the music industry, magazines, um, going down to the pub and being judged by people, feeling like you need to look a certain way, it's all there. It's, there's, the judgment is there in every 
culture. It's who we follow, what we follow, what we choose to support that ends up having the influence on us. It's interesting that you mentioned a couple of times, you know, but they're so common, but the medical and health research council and, and you know, I guess the mental health researchers and the leaders, leadership of this country do not see eating disorders as common and as something that um, needs to be a primary focus. Out of the 583 people who voted on my Instagram story to have been affected by an eating disorder, 471 of them felt that help was not easily accessible. When you go to the people, when you don't wait for them to come to treatment yeah. centres, the numbers are there. You know, that's what my research does. We, we go to people with the adolescent sample. We have 5,000 adolescents and found that 20% had either a subclinical or, or major clinical eating disorder. That's huge. <laughs> Do we like one in five adolescents have an eating disorder? That's that's epidemic proportions but it's overlooked because when we ask how many of those actually were accessing or had ever 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 accessed any kind of treatment let alone whether it was good treatment it was the 10 percent oh, eating disorder treatment is such a privilege and to get to the point where you are willing to reach out and then to be told oh wait sorry you can't afford this um is just so confronting. I tried to check into a day clinic because I was so unwell that I didn't think I could do it on therapy alone and they told me that I would need up to $300 a week in order to just pop in three or four days a week for the treatment that I needed to get better. The fact that I personally couldn't afford it just baffled me because I'm coming from a place of privilege. I just, I just couldn't comprehend how something that is so necessary and so prevalent in today's society could be so expensive. I ended up going to see a psychologist and she was amazing. Um, credit to her because I still feel amazing. I think it also was time for me and I was ready and I was willing this time. I came in and I did the work because I wanted to be better and I got better. That's the end of the story, I got better. I mean, it's only been two years now, but I literally feel like a different person. My psychologist taught me to be kind to myself. She taught me to, to recognize that I was just seeking to control something because I felt like my life was out of control. And now I have these tools in place and I'm so grateful to her. And I just, I never want anyone to go through that much time when they don't need to. I guess we could really target um, improvement of understanding of eating disorders and the treatment and prevention of eating disorders in, in numerous ways, um, but they are the angles that we would need to take. So we need health promotion, so you're talking about education there. That could be through social media, through media. Part of that can also be the education of health professionals. And then you have sort of prevention programs and treatment programs, which both need to be targeted. So the prevention programs will mean that hopefully fewer people develop an eating disorder and the treatment programs will hopefully you know, reduce the numbers who already have an eating disorder. How do you feel about the body positivity and Instagram versus reality movement happening on um, social media at the moment? I really love it. I think when it's done authentically, there's people who are kind of like faking it. You know, if you are, the ideal body type and you're like when I sit down I get rolls and it's just like your skin I don't think that's helpful but I do appreciate what they're trying to do I love seeing women who are like this is what my body looks like with my leggings up and this is what it looks like with my leggings down you know when it's not sucked in I, I think that's great but I don't think everybody should feel they have to be doing that it's completely okay to be super fit going to the gym every day looking amazing but it's completely okay to put on weight during a pandemic, to have postpartum depression, to feel like crap on your period and bloat and feel like you put on two dress sizes. Like, as long as you're being honest about the spectrum of who you are, you're Sasha Fierce and you're Beyonce, you know? Like, showing both sides 
is the most authentic authentic thing you can do because then you don't have women looking at themselves on their best days or in a really good picture being like oh, I know I don't look like that no you do look like that that is you that is a part of you too they can both exist in the same world and both are enough and both are perfect in different ways Social media and influencer culture has a lot of power. There is no denying that, but that power can be wielded in a positive or a negative way. And I don't think it's fair to blame influencers for people's low self-esteem and poor body image. But I do think it's important to acknowledge the effect that it has had and that it is a factor in this. And in acknowledging the power that social media has in that negative way, we also need to acknowledge the power that it has to do positive things. People are creating left, right and centre such inspiring content at the moment and I think it's really important to draw a light to those influences. When it comes to social media, it is probably the one area in our life that we can genuinely choose what we consume, what we see, what we are surrounded by. And, you know, if that means unfollowing the people that don't make you feel good about yourself and following more people who do create content around body positivity, who make you feel comfortable in yourself and inspired to be the best version of yourself, um, then I think that's what we need to do. That's great. I think that's what we need to focus on because social media isn't going away. We just need to switch the gears. We need to change the tracks, stop going that way and start going that way. <laughs> If you or someone you know is suffering with issues relating to this video, please contact Butterfly's National Helpline on 1800 33 46 73 or visit their website. That's what I did and I can tell you that nothing feels better than the freedom of recovery.